I'm so grateful to Fred Pratt Green for expressing what I often feel, most of all, that love has found us. Thanks be to God. That love has called us here and meets us in the scriptures that we've read today. Please join me as we pray. Jesus, invite us this morning to remember anew that all we have and all we are is but a gift from you. We want to love you and to serve you and to be faithful stewards. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In our home growing up in Harrison, there was a collection of biblical storybooks, Noah's Ark, the Tower of Babel, Joseph and the Coat of Many Colors, the Parable of the Lost Sheep, the Parable of the Talents, and today's parable, the Parable of Lazarus and the Rich Man. As a kid, the Parable of the Lost Sheep comforted me. The Parable of the Talents terrified me. And the Parable of Lazarus and the Rich Man confused me. Why would dogs lick someone's sores? Did heaven really mean being in Abraham's bosom? I th thought that was something my mother had. But I understood with the illustrations that it was sitting on Abram's lap. How could heaven and hell be so far away that no one could pass between them and yet be so close that one person could recognize another person on the other side? As I grew older, I came to realize that some, if not all, of those questions were unanswerable for the simple reason that I think they were the wrong questions to ask. As I've reflected on this parable further, I've come to realize that perhaps the parable really isn't meant to give us a literal description of heaven and hell. The parable's not one of those that describes the kingdom of God, nor is the parable meant to teach us about the character of God. If you read it carefully, you may realize, as I did, that God isn't even mentioned in this parable. So if the parable does not tell us about the character of God, if it does not tell us about the reign of God, what's it all about? Well, I believe that this parable is meant to teach us something about ourselves. I think it's meant to teach us how to make a difference in this world that God loves so much. Isn't that something we can all relate to? Everyone wants their life to make a difference. We may not all get the chance to achieve fame and fortune, but we all do get the chance to make life count. It's in our nature to strive for this. In fact, all an employer has to do to destroy a worker's morale is to give out meaningless and insignificant tasks. A worker who feels that they are not making a contribution soon becomes demoralized and disgruntled. It's been proven again and again that people will work harder for less money if they believe what they do makes a difference. And I believe that the Bible is intended to help us live lives that make a difference, to live lives that really count. And our model for this lesson, our model is the early church. The Christians of the first century had a tremendous impact on the world in spite of the fact that they were small in number, they had no money, and the government was against them. Considering all they had going against them and all that we have going for us, there should be no limit to what we can accomplish if we will follow their example. So might I suggest that the first step in making a difference, the first step in making your life count, is learning, as they did, how to give. In the book of Acts, Paul quotes Jesus as saying, it is more blessed to give than to receive. This was certainly the attitude in the person who wrote that letter to Timothy that Heather read from. And it was certainly the attitude of the early church. From the very beginning, the church was involved in helping others. 
In Acts 2, we see the church sharing all things in common. In Acts 4, we see believers selling their possessions and giving to those in need. In Acts 6, we see the church distributing goods to widows and orphans. In Acts 15, a council of church leaders met and decided that a primary focus of church ministry is outreach to the poor. From the very beginning, the church has been committed to the principle of giving, and still is today. Today, the Church of Jesus Christ is making a difference all around the world because the church is made up of millions of givers. In fact, if all the good things being done in the name of Christ were suddenly to stop, the world would spin into chaos. In Canada alone, thousands would become homeless. Tens of thousands would have no food to eat. Thousands of children wouldn't have decent clothes to wear to school or wouldn't receive gifts at Christmas. If all the good being done in the name of Christ were to stop today, it would be only weeks before tens of millions of people around the world might starve to death. Considering this, it could be argued that the church is in some way holding the world together. We are making a difference in the world because Christians, for the most part, are committed to giving. In fact, I would go so far as to say that being a Christian means being a giver. Anyone who wants their life to make a difference will be willing to put in more than they take out from society or family or church or relationships or business. With that in mind, I'd like to suggest that we consider three ways that we can become better at giving. First of all, as that letter to Timothy suggests, we must be content with what we have. And emotionally, this is the hard part for me, emotionally we must be willing to let go of possessions. I read a quote yesterday attributed to the Dalai Lama who said, People were created to be loved. Things were created to be used. The reason why the world is in crisis is because things are being loved and people are being used. Before we can begin to give, we've got to let go of our attachment to things. John Michael Talbot is the general minister of the Hermitage, a community of monks, nuns, and families belonging to a religious order called the Brothers and Sisters of Charity. Everyone in this group is committed to living a simple life and has relinquished all but the necessary possessions. And when talking about this, Talbot said, taking a vow of poverty is not a cure for materialism. Many people, he said, come to this community and go from being selfish with thousands of dollars to being selfish with a coffee mug. The problem is not what we have. The problem is our attachment to what we have. In order to become better at giving, we have to let go. Some of the happiest people I know are people who walk the thin line of having things because you have to have things and having things without being attached to them. And I think I see in my children and their generation a group who are better at that than I am. Being a Christian means being a giver and we can't become better at giving if we're so attached to our money and our things that we can't let go of them. It's no coincidence that the word misery begins with miser. Misers hang on to their things forever and they often end up miserable. Our lives will never really make a difference if we don't first learn to be content with what we have and to emotionally let go. The second way I believe we could become better givers is to invest in people rather than possessions. The writer of the letter to Timothy says we are to do good, we are to be rich in good works, to be generous, and to be ready to share. 
Every successful business person understands that his or her greatest asset is not his product or her equipment. The greatest asset is the people who work with them. Companies who invest in building people become successful. So do churches. Businesses succeed on a large scale when they grasp the concept that people are more valuable than things. And in the church, we know that people are more valuable than things. A quick study of the book of Acts teaches us that the early church made a difference because so many Christians believe that it's better to change lives than it is to own things. As a result, they sold some of their possessions and gave them money to the apostles. But a couple quick notes about this. First, this giving was completely voluntary. The apostles didn't require it or force people to do it. And secondly, these people were selling extra possessions, not basic possessions. In other words, they weren't forcing themselves into poverty. They were just simplifying their lives. That's sure something I could do. It doesn't mean we can't own things or have things or collect things, but it does mean that our first priority is changing lives, not accumulating possessions. This principle will influence the way we give and the way we do ministry. Reaching people is more important than building buildings. Now that's not to say that we don't appreciate the work and commitment of, of those who left us this grand building and the generosity of those who came before us and kept it intact all these years. But let's remember, the people who built these churches were a church for many, many years before they stepped out in faith to build buildings. They were a church reaching more and more people, and they realized that the city was growing and they needed more room. But they also knew that people were more important, and reaching people was the goal. When we give, when we do ministry, when we do business, when we vote, whatever we do, I think we should look for ways to invest in people, not possessions. The third way we become better givers, I believe, is to look for opportunities to give. The truth is, we're more likely to look for reasons not to give than we are to look for chances to give. Besides, some of you may say, I have too many things coming at me already. I get tapped about a dozen times a month from one imaginable charity group or another. Well, yes, it's true that there are many organizations out there asking for our money, and if you give to one, chances are that your name gets on some charitable giver's list that gets passed around. And unless you're very, very wealthy, you have to be selective with where you give your money. And unless you have all the time in the world, you must be selective where, with where you give your time. Obviously, at least it seems obvious to me, when it comes to money and time, one of the best places to give is right here at church. There are many ways the church puts your time and your money to good use. But when you give beyond the local church, I encourage you to look for ministries that excite you, to look for ministries that you are passionate about, work that you are thrilled to support. Maybe you would like to give to a mission team that smuggles the Bible into countries where it's not allowed. Maybe you'd like to help build houses for people in the West Indies who live in shacks. Maybe you'd like to give to the United Church Mission and Service Fund that helps support gatherings of people who are left on the margins of society and supports educational events that help us learn what we can do about it. Or agencies that respond to emergencies like the crisis in India or Ukraine or Iran or Russia. Or maybe you would simply like to send a kid to camp. I could go on and on. There are many opportunities to give and many of you are a part of that already. I just encourage you to find a ministry that excites you and to support it. And please, please don't get the impression that I'm talking only about giving money. That's really not it at all. The volunteers I work with 
here at the meal program on Thursday, the volunteers I work with at the food bank go home bone weary, but energized and enriched by sharing their time and compassion. Another of my volunteer jobs is on the Poverty Awareness Working Group at Islington United. This has been an eye-opening experience for us on the group, learning about poverty in our city and our province and our country. We learned at our last meeting that there are a quarter of a million people living in poverty in the city of Toronto. Among these are what we casually refer to as the working poor. We don't have to look far to find our mission field. And so I ask you, as I ask myself, what is the living Christ calling us to do? Because being a Christian means getting involved. Being a Christian means being a giver. And it's not just money we give. It's ourselves, our time, our kindness, our friendship. We give because Christ first gave to us. 2,000 years ago, Jesus came into the world, and while he was here, he gave so much of himself to his followers. He, he spent time with them, he laughed with them, he taught them, he healed them, he fed them, he met their financial needs, he poured his life into them, and he in introduced them to a loving, benevolent God who was reaching out. And that's not all. Perhaps the most important part of the story is that Jesus didn't just give of himself, he gave himself. He died a painful death on the cross so that we might be reconciled to God. He died so that we could be forgiven and could know what it feels like to be clean inside, so that we could live in peace with others, with God, and with ourselves. Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. By giving his life, Christ made a difference in our lives that will last for eternity. By giving ourselves to him and to others, we too can make a difference that will last forever. May God bless you as you pick up your ministry and as you follow your heart to give as God calls you.